Walters954, and I guess Casanova here. What were you doing, Casanova the coding cat? <laughs> Salesforce development can be complex, but it does not need to be confusing. There's so many different things that you can learn, so it's hard to pick actually what you need to learn, especially when you are first starting out. That's why I've created a Salesforce developer roadmap for those beginning developers to kind of follow along and understand the more important things that they should be looking at. Hey everybody, Walters954 here. I've been doing Salesforce development for a pretty long time now, and I'm starting to impart my knowledge onto you new developers and those that want to start learning development even more. In this video, I'm going to focus on this developer roadmap that I have created, which will help walk you through some of the different areas that you should be looking at so you can focus on the most important things and stop getting lost in all of the things that are available on the great platform of Salesforce. You can grab this PDF guide completely free over at salesforcementor.com. And there's even an expanded version that you can go through, which has even more detail on all of the different areas you should be looking into. And in the expanded version, there are links to different resources related to each of the different sections. So of course, we're going to start in programming fundamentals. These are the building blocks that you need to write code in any language. And of course, all of these are super important, right? You need to be able to write variables, flow control. So these are your if statements and other kind of logic statements, your collections. How do you use those, even though they're very similar to your variables and your data types, but how do you work with arrays and different sets of data? How do you collect them all together and then manipulate those values? You, of course, have loops. So these are things like your traditional for loops and there are enhanced for loops loops and list for loops and even deeper inside that you'll have your break statements continues so lots of very interesting things inside of looping and looping is super critical for just building efficient code there are also classes objects and functions now this could potentially have been lumped into the object oriented programming section but i think just learning them in general right some of the general structures of how you create like functions and use classes and things like that is super important because as soon as you start talking about object oriented programming you go more into some of these aspects here like constructors inheritance and polymorphism now these are critically important especially when it comes to the salesforce ecosystem but it's okay when you're first starting starting out to just get a general understanding of these and of course diving into a lot of these concepts later on as you're learning more in the Salesforce ecosystem. Now I love this entire section because you can learn all of these things and then apply to so many different languages. You don't even have to learn these in Apex. I almost recommend learning in Java, which is a language very similar to Apex, like Apex is a flavor of Java, basically. So you learn all of these in, using whatever resources you're comfortable with, and then you can translate it over into Salesforce development. In terms of those resources, I recommend CS50, which is a Harvard computer science class, Code Academy, where you can get hands-on with many different languages, but I really like the Java course. And of course, Cloud Code Academy, this is my program where we teach you Salesforce development and all of these fundamentals are included. Next, let's take a peek at tooling because all of this code is great, right? But where do we actually write it, especially as Salesforce developers? So on this side, we're talking more the tools that you need to write your code. And this really dives into the integrated development environment piece. So this is using Visual Studio Code to start writing your actual Salesforce code. Gone are the days of using the developer console. Just start out learning Visual Studio Code code and using like the Salesforce extension pack and of course learning those shortcuts inside of there. If you're just getting started out though, it's okay to use a developer console for like a few of those introductory and basic programming things, but it's really important to start getting hands on with VS Code as your primary editor. And of course with that, Salesforce DX kind of rolls into that. 
There are some advanced topics on here that you should just kind of read up on, especially like scratch orgs. You're starting to dive deeper into Salesforce development versus just sticking in a general sense, which can be good in the beginning, but we want to be Salesforce developers, right? This is Salesforce development roadmap. We've seen those crazy salaries that Salesforce developers can make. So this is why the roadmap is pushing us into that Salesforce direction. Of course, we have things like version control, getting used to using Git and branching, right? All of these nodes are super important for managing your code. If it's not your code versions, you're potentially working with other people on teams and tracking that code base. And even your metadata that exists inside of Salesforce can be put into version control tools, which are super useful. One thing a little bit more advanced is like GitHub Actions doing some automation in your branches or in your repositories. And this kind of ties very closely into CI CD, which can be super fun, but get very complex. And of course I had to throw in the AI tools. And this is why this document is going to continue to get updated yearly. We've seen an explosion over the last year with different AI tools that can be super helpful in learning and for coding in itself. I'm putting chat GPT and GitHub Copilot on here, but especially for those beginner developers, I don't want you to focus very heavily on having these tools write all the code for you, especially chat GPT, use it to debug your code, right? Use it to ask questions and get answers on, okay, why am I getting this SQL error? What's this logical error that I'm getting inside of my code? What's the best approach or some best practice that I should work with when I'm writing my code. ChatGPT can help point you in the right direction, but if you try to throw like your entire code base or whatever problem you're working on in there, it can easily spit out some answer that gives you a bunch of errors and then it will steer you in the wrong direction. Similar setup with GitHub Copilot. I really only recommend you to use this once you're way past the fundamentals and you're starting to move deeper into getting the best practices down because they can steer you wrong. So to reduce being steered in the wrong direction, I often recommend getting a mentor. I know in the past Salesforce had mentorship platforms that you could go on and kind of sign up, but those have gone away. And recently I saw that there was a trailblazer mentorship program that got launched. So I signed up there to be a mentor. And I think that's a great place for people to find experienced Salesforce development mentors. So definitely check it out if you haven't already. Moving into some more fun stuff, we have Apex Fundamentals. This is where we're going to start putting all of those programming building blocks to work. And now we have a little bit of tooling that we can marry it together so that we can actually write our code on the Salesforce platform. So in this, we're going to kind of not really relearn, but make sure that we understand the specifics of Apex in terms of its data types. This is figuring out the different data types that we want to use. And it's very important, right? When you're working with a currency field, what's the correct data type? When you're working with IDs of records, what's the correct data type? And there's actually an ID data type for that. So it's important to know the correct types of data types and working with S objects and how all of that kind of plays into collections and using maps and wire maps so important for Salesforce development. Then we jump into SOQL. We haven't really touched on querying yet and it may need to be added into some of this programming fundamentals, which I'll just add it into uh, here right now, right? We have SQL, which is a querying language, right? A very common one. And then we have the Salesforce object query language. So SOQL, and this is how we get data out of the Salesforce database and into our code so that we can do calculations, do manipulations on the sets of data. Database manipulation language or DML are the basic CRUD operations, right? Your create, read, update, and delete that we have inside of Salesforce. So now we're able to grab our data with SOQL and then manipulate our data, right? Insert new ones, update the values that are in there. And this is where the kind of magic starts to happen with all of our code. With all of those changes though, we have some limits that Salesforce force puts in place so that we don't break things, right? These are the governor limits. And since Salesforce is a multi-tenant environment, we have to make sure that 
our system, our code is not using up too many resources. This is where the governor limits come into play and you need to be aware of the different ones that exist, especially the ones that are around SOCL and DML statements, right? This is where the best practices of like bulkification come into play and we haven't talked about triggers yet. I guess it's up next. So your, your trigger best practices as well of having like one trigger per object. So we want to talk about magic. Let's take a look at Salesforce triggers. What triggers do are basically when events happen, your CRUD events or your DML events, when those go off, your Apex code can execute, often calling called like invoking your Apex code. But essentially when you insert a record, let's say we insert a contact or a lead, you can create a trigger that will then fire some of your Apex code, execute some of your Apex code. Now this code could be any business logic you like, maybe it's counting values, maybe it's sending an integration, which we haven't talked about yet, sending an email, like all of these things. This is where your business logic starts coming alive when you're using triggers to execute a lot of your code. And with all this code that we're writing, we need to then start working on test classes. Testing is super important because it makes you know that your code is actually working. It's writing code to make sure that your code is doing what you think your code is doing. And Salesforce is actually really interesting in this aspect. It's the only platform that has heard of it that does this, but it requires that you have 75% code coverage before you're able to deploy anything to production. So you can work in a sandbox all you want, but as if it's going to production, you need to have code coverage on there. There are some system classes in Apex, a lot of them actually, but some more important than others. The string, math, and date class, definitely look into them if you are a beginner programmer. And then we have all of this stuff inside of advanced Apex. If you're just starting out, it's okay to kind of skip over this or maybe do some reading on it, especially like asynchronous and Apex callouts, but they are very important for making sure that your code is efficient and doing just some of those things that you need to do in development, like using APIs for callouts and design pattern, exception handling, very important that you have a plan or some sort of exception handling when your code isn't doing what you expect it to do. When you're trying to learn some of these concepts, there are a few resources that I recommend. Of course, there's Trailhead, Salesforce's learning platform. There's Camp Apex and apexsandbox.io where you can get hands on. And then, like I mentioned earlier, Cloud Code, which is a combination of the fundamentals of programming and Apex fundamentals. You're learning them all at the same time. And we even cover a lot of the advanced Apex topics. So let's move on to Lightning Web Components. And this is really where you're trying to make custom user interfaces. Think of this like traditional web development for Salesforce. So there's a front end component and a back end. And oftentimes Salesforce developers are basically full stack developers, right? You're working on the back end of Apex and then writing these Lightning Web Components, which are the front end pieces. So lots of things to learn in here. And there could be an entire branch that is just JavaScript fundamentals because JavaScript is its own language, but since we know those basics building blocks, it's not going to be as hard to pick up a language like JavaScript. There's a ton of Salesforce specific things though, like data binding and certain event handling that goes on with Salesforce development. So it's important that you start to dive a little bit deeper on how Lightning Web components work. And of course, Trailhead is a great spot for that, but I love just getting hands on. Since LWC is a modern web web framework. Of course, you can do things like styling with CSS. And there is an existing library that Salesforce provides called SLDS, which gives you kind of like a base to start off with to make sure that your code and your designs look very similar to Salesforce. And speaking of making things look like Salesforce, there is a component library, which is just pre-built elements that have existing functionality that you can use already. So it's very important for you to get into the component library, see what components already exist so that you're not reinventing the wheel on that one. This will be very helpful on your LWC journey and make sure that you speed up in your development. And of course, there's the component aspect of it, right? You're stacking these 
different HTML elements inside of each other. So you need to make sure that they can communicate properly. And this is potentially an advanced topic. It's it's in here in custom events, but it's it's such an important or foundational item that we have it even outside here. Then we jump into a lot of the advanced topics. And if you haven't written like one or two LWCs and at least have gotten started, don't really worry about some of the other pieces in here. But once you start dabbling in them even more and you like doing LWC development, look at some of these advanced topics. And a lot of them I go over in my LWC course, which is on salesforcementor.com. So check that out in the description. Now there definitely is a lot in this Salesforce developer roadmap, but this should give you a little more focus and not needing to worry about all of the other things that exist out here in development, right? If you focus on these items, you'll get really good at Salesforce development and probably be ready for a junior level job, right? All of these things you will see on job descriptions and people will ask you about in interviews. Of course, let me know in the comments what you think about this roadmap. Have I missed anything? Are there pieces that I should dive deeper on? I would love to hear it. Now we know what Salesforce development concepts to focus on, but that doesn't guarantee you a Salesforce job. You've got to do a lot of things like resume building and interviewing and get that door open. And one of the best tools to open the door into Salesforce development are all the different certifications. And if you don't know which ones to focus on, check out this video over here that goes over my top three Salesforce developer certifications. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Walters954, and remember, I believe in you.